Beneath the surface of jazz clubs and flapper dresses in the 1920s and 30s, darker forces were brewing. Secret meetings, fiery speeches, and marching bands hailed a vision of America that would chill the bones of its founders. In a land where freedom is celebrated, how could a movement rooted in control and exclusion ever gain traction? The story of American fascism forces us to reconsider the resilience of democracy. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Compelling History. Today we'll be finishing our series of videos exploring the history of fascism, with a look at America's not-so-distant history with fascism. We'll begin by taking a look at the rise of fascism movements in the United States during the early 20th century, before finishing with how the country avoid the same dark fate as countries like Italy or Spain. Also, make sure you stick around until the end to learn about the resurgence of American fascism. If you're new here, we'll release videos every week exploring specific historical events or figures as part of a larger monthly topic. If you like this video or learned something new, consider giving this video a thumbs up and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on our future videos. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get into the video. It began with whispers about patriotism, strength, and unity. But behind the slogans lay something far more dangerous. In the shadow of economic despair and political unrest, a movement took root in the United States, mirroring a sinister ideology sweeping across Europe. To understand the rise of fascism in the United States during the 20th century, it is critical to first define what fascism meant in the American context. European fascism, rooted in hypernationalism, authoritarianism, and militarism, was adapted in the U.S. to fit its unique cultural and historical framework. American fascism often cloaked itself in the language of patriotism and religious righteousness, playing on fears of racial and ideological threats. Nativism, xenophobia, and the supremacy of white Americans were central tenets, reinforced by long-standing systems like Jim Crow laws and the eugenics movement. Unlike in Europe, where fascist leaders sought to establish new imperial orders, American fascists claimed to defend democracy while seeking to dismantle it, presenting fascism as a moral alternative to the perceived chaos of liberalism and leftism. The roots of this ideology in America stretched back to the late 19th century, with the passage of Jim Crow laws in the South and the rise of anti-immigrant movements targeting Eastern and Southern Europeans. By the interwar period, the movement gained momentum as the Great Depression devastated the U.S. economy, creating fertile ground for fascist rhetoric. Amid soaring unemployment and fears of social collapse, many Americans sought simplistic answers to complex problems. Figures like philosopher Jason Stanley have argued that white supremacy in America embodied the fascist politics of hierarchy, demanding the perpetual dominance of one racial group over others. At the same time, admiration for European fascism spread among segments of the American elite. As Noam Chomsky pointed out in Hegemony or Survival, the rise of regimes like Mussolini's Italy was seen by some American officials and businessmen as a bulwark against communism and labor movements. William Phillips, the U.S. ambassador to Italy, praised Mussolini for his astounding achievements, and the State Department lauded fascism for restoring order and solvency. This approval reflected a disturbing alignment of American fascist sympathies with ultranationalist ideals abroad. During this period, several groups emerged in the United States that historians now classify as fascist organizations. The Ku Klux Klan KKK, revived in the 1920s, exemplified this alignment with its emphasis on white supremacy, anti-immigrant sentiment, and violent enforcement of its ideology. The Black Legion, a paramilitary offshoot of the KKK, went even further by attempting to overthrow the federal government and establish a fascist state, though its influence remained small. One of the most prominent groups was the German-American Bund established in 1936. Modeled on Hitler's Nazi party, the Bund promoted a favorable view of Nazi Germany while cloaking its ideology in American patriotism. At its peak, the Bund held rallies that blended Nazi and American symbolism, including a notorious event at Madison Square Garden in 1939, attended by 20,000 people. Leaders of the Bund openly attacked Jewish Americans, trade unions, and Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration, branding his New Deal as the Jew Deal. While the Bund faced significant public backlash and legal challenges, including the arrest and deportation of its leader, Fritz Kuhn, it illustrated how fascist ideologies could take root in a nation built on democratic principles. 
Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest with a popular radio program in the 1930s, also became a central figure in the American fascist movement. Initially a supporter of Roosevelt, Coughlin turned against the New Deal, propagating anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and denouncing both the president and the big banks. His rhetoric drew millions of listeners and reflected the broader susceptibility of American audiences to authoritarian ideologies during times of crisis. The economic uncertainty and fear of communism gave rise to smaller but equally troubling groups like the Silver Legion of America, founded by William Dudley Pelly. Known as the Silver Shirts, this paramilitary organization embraced fascist ideals, including white supremacy and anti-Semitism, while presenting itself as the savior of American values. These movements never coalesced into a singular political force, but their presence revealed how the seeds of fascism could sprout in American soil, fueled by economic despair, racial tensions, and a longing for order. While often dismissed as fringe, these movements laid bare the vulnerabilities in a society grappling with its ideals of democracy and equality. While Europe descended into dictatorship during the 1930s, America faced its own flirtations with authoritarianism. Economic despair from the Great Depression created fertile ground for radical ideologies, and the allure of fascism seemed a plausible threat. The Americans were forced to confront unsettling questions. Could democracy endure? How far would they go to protect it? The stock market crash of 1929 plunged the nation into its deepest economic crisis. Unemployment reached catastrophic levels, millions lost their homes, and more than 5,000 banks failed. Social unrest rippled across the country as desperate protests and violent rhetoric filled the streets. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal sought to stabilize the nation with sweeping reforms, but these efforts provoked fierce backlash from America's wealthiest elites who viewed his policies as a direct assault on their fortunes. Among them, whispers of a fascist coup began to spread. The most infamous attempt to overthrow Roosevelt's government came to light in 1933, when retired Marine Corps Major General Smedley Butler testified to Congress about a conspiracy led by financiers within the American Liberty League. These conspirators, outraged by Roosevelt's decision to abandon the gold standard and implement redistributive policies, sought to fund and arm a private army of 500,000 veterans to march on Washington, oust Roosevelt, and dismantle the New Deal. Prominent industrialists, including J.P. Morgan Jr. and executives from General Motors and Birdseye, allegedly supported the coup. Butler, a decorated war hero revered by veterans, was chosen to lead the effort but instead exposed the plot, condemning its architects as traitors. Congressional investigations substantiated many of his claims, but no formal charges were filed, and the wealthiest plotters largely escaped public accountability. Butler lamented that the committee slaughtered the little and allowed the big to escape. The exposure of the so-called business plot underscored how deeply divided America was during this period. FDR's detractors accused him of tyranny, while militias like the khaki shirts and silver shirts gained traction, drawing inspiration from Mussolini's black shirts and Hitler's brown shirts. These groups, rooted in white supremacy, anti-Semitism, and militarism, openly advocated for authoritarian rule. Public figures such as Henry Ford and Charles Lindbergh amplified fascist sympathies, while rallies organized by the German-American Bund mirrored Nazi spectacles in Germany, stoking controversy and fear across the nation. Resistance to fascism in America came from various quarters. Figures like Butler, despite personal disagreements with Roosevelt, prioritized the Constitution above political leanings, exposing plots that endangered democracy. Labor unions, civil rights groups, and grassroots movements worked tirelessly to counteract fascist propaganda and curb the influence of paramilitary organizations. The American Civil Liberties Union ACLU, and the Anti-Defamation League ADL, were among the organizations that fought to preserve democratic ideals. Anti-fascist Italian expatriates in the Mazzini Society also contributed to the effort, rallying against Mussolini's influence both in the United States and abroad. The American public, witnessing the horrors of European fascism, largely rejected authoritarianism. Popular sentiment, while strained by economic uncertainty, remained wary of movements that sought to undermine democratic principles. Still, the specter of fascism lingered, and even after the immediate threat had passed, those who had opposed it were not always celebrated. During the Second Red Scare, individuals who had resisted fascism in its early days were labeled premature anti-fascists. Their loyalty to the United States called into question during a time of heightened suspicion of communism. 
Had fascist movements in America succeeded, the consequences would have been devastating. Early actions likely would have included repealing New Deal legislation, dismantling labor unions, and enacting sweeping censorship laws to silence opposition. Racial and religious minorities would have faced systemic persecution under policies echoing the Nuremberg Laws, and democratic institutions like the press would have been gutted, creating an atmosphere of fear and repression. The events of the 1930s serve as a stark reminder of democracy's fragility. Roosevelt's calm resolve inspired Americans to unite against fear, while his policies stabilized a nation teetering on the edge of collapse. When asked how close America came to falling into dictatorship, Congressman John McCormick put it best. When times are desperate and people are frustrated, anything could happen. Nearly a century later, those words still resonate as a cautionary tale for the modern age. Movements built on fear and hatred are often loud, but they are rarely enduring. At its height, it seemed unstoppable, but within a decade, America's flirtation with fascism fell apart. The American fascist movement, though never as powerful as its European counterparts, revealed how fragile democratic institutions can be when confronted with economic instability and social unrest. During the 1930s, organizations like the Silver Legion of America, the German-American Bund, and other nativist groups exploited fears stemming from the Great Depression. Leaders like William Dudley Pelley and Fritz Kuhn modeled their movements on European fascist regimes, promoting authoritarian ideologies wrapped in nationalist and often explicitly racist rhetoric. Public events, like the German-American Bund's infamous 1939 Madison Square Garden rally, where swastikas and American flags shared the stage, highlighted their attempt to normalize such ideologies in American society. Initially, many Americans found these movements difficult to take seriously. Figures like Mussolini and his American imitators were often dismissed as comical or inconsequential, as Hollywood films of the time reflected. However, the rise of Hitler in 1933 changed this perception. The Nazi regime's rapid consolidation of power, including book burnings, mass incarcerations of political opponents, and discriminatory laws targeting Jewish citizens, made fascism seem far more sinister. American fascist groups began to mimic these tactics, pushing propaganda that blamed Jewish Americans, immigrants, and communists for the nation's struggles. Media personalities like Father Charles Coughlin amplified these messages on the radio, weaving anti-Semitic and anti-communist rhetoric into their broadcasts. Resistance, however, was swift. Labor unions, immigrant groups, and Jewish organizations worked tirelessly to expose and counteract fascist propaganda. Protests erupted at events like the Madison Square Garden Rally, where grassroots activists clashed with Boone supporters, creating public spectacles that undermined the movement's credibility. Investigative journalists uncovered links between American fascist groups and Nazi Germany, further discrediting their claims of patriotism. The widespread public perception that these groups were fifth columns poised to aid the Axis powers further eroded their support. World War II marked a decisive turning point. As the U.S. entered the conflict, the government intensified its crackdown on fascist activities. Leaders like Pelley and Kuhn were arrested and convicted on charges ranging from sedition to embezzlement. The Great Sedition Trial of 1944 sought to address lingering fascist elements, though the mistrial due to the death of the judge left an ambiguous legacy. At the same time, wartime propaganda emphasized democracy and unity, effectively marginalizing fascist sympathizers. The war effort itself sealed the movement's fate. Millions of Americans mobilized to fight fascism abroad, further solidifying public opposition to its ideologies at home. Organizations like the American Nazi Party emerged later in 1959, led by figures such as George Lincoln Rockwell. Yet these groups failed to achieve widespread influence, often viewed as relics of a discredited ideology. Rockwell's assassination in 1967 and the dissolution of his party in 1983 underscored the decline of organized fascism in the United States. By the war's end, most fascist organizations had dissolved, their ideologies thoroughly discredited. The association with Nazi atrocities and the destruction wrought by World War II rendered their rhetoric untenable. Yet the conditions that allowed these movements to arise, economic inequality, social unrest, and racial tensions, remained, manifesting in new forms over the decades. The collapse of the American fascist movement provides a critical lesson. Democracy requires vigilance. The suppression of these movements during World War II, coupled with the grassroots resistance of ordinary citizens, illustrates the power of collective action. 
As history shows, combating authoritarian ideologies demands both institutional accountability and public engagement to safeguard democratic ideals. As promised earlier in the video, we'll also take a quick look into the resurgence of American fascism. As the resurgence of fascist tendencies unfolds in America, it is clear that the dynamics of authoritarianism are neither confined to history books nor distant shores. Scholars and commentators have increasingly drawn parallels between the political style of Donald Trump and historical fascist leaders. While there remains debate about whether Trump fits the precise definition of a fascist, his rhetoric, policy proposals, and alignment with far-right movements reveal undeniable authoritarian patterns. Trump's political ascent has been marked by the use of nationalist rhetoric, the vilification of marginalized groups, and efforts to undermine democratic norms, elements that resonate with classic fascist strategies. From his refusal to accept the 2020 election results to his inflammatory stand back and stand by directive to the Proud Boys, the parallels are stark. Events such as the January 6th Capitol attack, which some compare to historical coup attempts like Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch, underscore the dangerous potential of these movements to escalate into violence. Moreover, modern platforms like social media amplify these ideologies, creating fertile ground for conspiracy theories and polarizing rhetoric. QAnon, the Great Replacement Theory, and misinformation campaigns have contributed to a volatile political landscape where authoritarianism thrives. As Trump's 2024 campaign continues to embrace authoritarian and anti-democratic positions, including threats to suppress dissent and deploy military force against political opponents, the urgency to confront these patterns grows. Yet this is not the first time the United States has faced such challenges. Scholars like Ruth ben Giad emphasize that Trump's tactics mirror those of historical fascist leaders in their focus on spectacle, loyalty, and control. Former top officials, including Trump's own chief of staff, Mark Milley, have openly described him as fascist to the core. Such assessments are echoed by a growing number of historians, journalists, and political analysts who see Trump's politics as emblematic of a new, uniquely American strain of fascism. History warns us that fascism does not always announce itself with grand declarations. Often it creeps in through complacency, economic instability, and a fraying social fabric. But the lessons of the past also offer hope. Resistance is possible, and democracy can endure. Today, that resistance takes many forms, from grassroots activism to the vigilance of civil society and democratic institutions. The fight against modern fascism in America is not just about resisting one leader or ideology. It is about safeguarding the principles of democracy and pluralism that underpin the nation's identity. As the United States grapples with these challenges, the burden falls on this generation to remain vigilant and to act decisively, proving that history's warnings have not fallen on deaf ears. Thank you so much for watching our video on fascism in the United States. We hope you enjoyed this video in our series exploring fascist movements around the world. Don't miss our future videos starting next week. Before you go, make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see more history-related content.